We're on Daf Pei Aleph Amad Aleph at the Mishnah. Ochal v'shasa behelam echad, ein ochaya velechatas echas. What the Mishnah is telling me is, is that if I do two different acts which are under the same prohibition of alleviating my suffering, the two different actions are eating and drinking. Remember, we learned previously that eating is one kind of alleviation of suffering, drinking is another kind of alleviation of suffering. So you might have thought that if I do them together, I should incur two different chiyuv, chiyuvim, two different karbanas chatas. So the Mishnah says no, since they're subsumed under the same pasuk of uh, a violation of suffering, so therefore I'm only going to be chayiv one carbon. However, achal ve'asa melacha chayiv shtei chatos. But if a person eats and does melacha on Yom Kippur at the same time, so in other words, in the same action or the same set of behavior, so then he's going to be high of two karbanos because he's violated Yom Kippur in two completely separate ways based on two different psukim. One pasuk talks about the violation of suffering, and the other pasuk talks about doing malacha. Achal ochlin she'enen ru'in l'achila v'shosamashkin she'enen ru'in l'shesia. Now, if a person eats food that's not edible, or if he drinks beverages that are not drinkable, those are called potable, right? They're not really meant for drinking. So then he's potter. He hasn't incurred the violation. Vishasa tziramuryas potter. And in the similar vein, if a person drinks a brine or a fish fatty brine, so then in both of those cases he's potter. Because even though these things are used as a dip or a dressing, to act as a condiment for food, but to drink them alone as a beverage that people don't use. Okay, Gemara now says, Amoresh Lakish. We're going to get into some technical details over here. The premise of the technicalities that we're going to be discussing today is, uh, uh, are as follows. Anytime the Torah lists a penalty for the violation of a mitzvah, it also has to tell me the mitzvah slow sasing. The Torah has to say, thou shalt not do X, in order for the Torah to say, anyone who does X shall be punished with Y. So if the Torah is going to tell me that on Yom Kippur, if I, if I disobey the rule of suffering, then I get kares, we would expect it for the Torah to say somewhere, thou shalt not eat on Yom Kippur, or thou shalt not violate the rule of suffering on Yom Kippur. Unfortunately, the Torah doesn't say that. So that's going to be the subject of our analysis. Reish Lakish says, Why is there no thou shalt not, which is the word azhara, in the context of inoi, of the commandment to suffer? Mishum delo efsher. Because the Gemara says, practically speaking, there's no way to phrase that in the Torah. Heichi nichta. What are we supposed to write? Nichtov rachmana lo yochel. Or lo, or lo sochlu, perhaps, you, what do you want the Torah to tell me? To, what, what should the Torah write? Don't eat, right? Achila b'kezayis. That would be misleading, because as we learned yesterday, the shear of achila is a kezayis, and the shear of violating enoi is with a kiko sevis, which is a larger shear. So if the word Torah would have said, thou shalt not eat on Yom Kippur, I would have been misled to the, to the proper shear. If the Torah would have said, do not suffer, then I would have thought just the exact opposite, that I'm supposed to eat on Yom Kippur. So what's the Torah supposed to write? Do not not suffer? Right? We don't have double negatives, but maybe we do, we'll see. So, Why should, maybe the Torah could have written, which is a language that we find, be careful lest thou not suffer. Right? That would be an interesting way of writing it. So the Gemara says, There's only one problem. The, both the word hishamer and the word pen imply a mitzvah slow sase. And therefore, if I would have written it in that way, um, I might have thought that there's more than one mitzvah slow sase. So, um, and therefore it's misleading. I would have thought that I violate two mitzvahs lo sase instead of one, and therefore the hishamer in pen is not at the appropriate verbiage. So maskif lor of bibi barabaya nichtov rachmana hishamer b'mitzvah inoy. Maybe the Torah should have written, be careful with the mitzvah inoy. And the word hishamer in the havamina 
always implies a mitzvah lo sase. So the Gemara now says, no, im kain he shamered the lav lav, he shamered the ase ase. No, the Gemara says, according to this thinking in the Gemara, and this is, of course, as Tosva says, the subject of a machlokes, that when the Torah uses the word he shamer in the context of a mitzvah ase, then it's not a, it's not to imply a mitzvah lo sase, it's to imply a mitzvah sase. In other words, to be careful in a positive commandment does not convert into a negative commandment. When the Torah uses the word hishamer in the context of something that you're not allowed to do, then it's interpreted as a mitzvah slo sase. But what does the word enoi mean? The word enoi means afflict yourself. So be careful to afflict yourself is not a mitzvah slo sase, it's a mitzvah sase. And therefore the verbiage of a mitzvah slo sase we're still having difficulty with. So maskaf lo ravashi nichtov al tasr min ho enoi. I have a solution, says Ravashi. The Torah could have written, do not desist from suffering. <laughs> That's an interesting way of phrasing it. So the Gemara says, you're right, Kasha. I don't have an answer as to why the Torah couldn't have written it that way. The Torah, the Torah, the Torah could have written it that way. Okay. Why well, couldn't just write, do not eat the size of a date? <laughs> then it would be, it'll be clear. <laughs> <laughs> but Shiurim are halacha Moshe Misina. Yeah, right. In other words, there are certain things that the Torah doesn't write. The Torah never talks about the Shir of Achila either. Okay, so now the Gemara says, Vitana Maisi La Mehacha. Now, we still haven't figured out, now that we don't have a text that says, Thou shalt not, we still have a question. Where is that text? Any, remember, I told you, any time you have a penalty, you also have to have a mitzvah lo sase accompanying it. So where is the mitzvah lo sase in the context of Yom Kippur? V'tana ma'isi mehacha. So we have a tana who brings it in the following b'risa. V'inisemes nafsho seichem v'chol malacha lo sa'asu. There are, in the same breath, the Torah says, afflict your souls and do not do any work. So yachal yehi anush... Al Tosefes Melacha, or, or Al Anush Kares, I should say, Al Tosefes Melacha, you might think, says the Brisa, that even though we know that there's an obligation to add on to Yom Kippur, Man Hachol Al Hakodesh, like we're going to learn later on in more detail, there's a mitzvah to add on. It's called Tosefes Yom Tov or Tosefes Shabbos or Tosefes Yom Kippur, that there's a mitzvah to take some of the previous day and some of the day after Yom Kippur and to append it. You start Yom Kippur early and you end Yom Kippur later. You might think that if a person does Malacha during that Tosefis period, not Yom Kippur proper, not the 10th of Tishrei proper, but he accepted Yom Kippur early on the 9th of Tishrei, you might think that if he does Malacha during that Tosefis period, he's going to get Kares. Tamulomar v'chol hanefesh asher lo sa'asechol Malacha be'etzem hayom hazeh. So the Torah says, no, only the soul that does malacha on that self-same day shall get kares. And what we see from that pasuk is, al shal yom anish kares ve'ina onish kares al tosefes malacha. That you only get kares when you do malacha on the day itself of Yom Kippur, not during the tosefes period. Yachalo yehei anush kares al tosefes malacha, avo yehei anush kares al tosefes inoi. You might think, okay, fine, he doesn't get kares for the Tosefis period if he does malacha during the Tosefis period. But what if he eats during the Tosefis period? What if he alleviates his suffering during the Tosefis period? Maybe he gets kares there. So there the Torah also uses the words be'etzem. On that self same day, if you do not afflict yourself, you get kares. There, that teaches me you, you don't get kares if you fail to afflict yourself during the Tosefis period. Okay, fine, we've established you don't get kares if you do malacha during the Tosefis period. But perhaps if I do malacha during the Tosefis period, I still incur a mitzvah lo sase. And we know that any time you do a mitzvah lo sase, you get malchus. So therefore, I need a special pasuk once again. Tamulomer v'chol malacha lo sasu be'etzem hayom hazeh. Al itzumo shel yom hu muzer ve'eno muzer al tosefes malacha. So we have an additional pasuk that says you may not do any work once again be'etzem hayom hazeh. 
right, during, on that self same day, that that second time it says Be'etzim Hayom Hazeh is to teach you that there's not even a mitzvah lo sase if I do malacha during the Tosefis period. Yacha lo yehi muzer al Tosefis malacha, lo yehi muzer al Tosefis inoy. So you might think, okay, fine. There's no negative commandment for doing malacha during the Tosefis period, but maybe there's a negative commandment of failing to suffer during the Tosefis period, so there's at least the mitzvah lo sase. Vidinu. The, the, the Bryce says, no, look, use logic. So the Gemara says, I'll make a kalva chomer. Which violation is more chamor, is more stringent? Doing malacha or failing to suffer? So the Brisa argues that doing malacha is a more serious crime because it's more universal. It applies not only on Yom Kippur, the Isser of Malacha, but it applies on Shabbos and Yom Tov as well. That shows that it's a more stringent prohibition. And if there's no negative violation during the Tosefis period for Malacha, then surely there's no negative violation for Enoi during the Tosefis period. So the Gemara says, Aval Azhara li'inoi shel Yom Atzmo lo lamadnu. Okay, so that all is very well and good about the Tosefis period. But then the Brysa says, where do we see the source text for the negative commandment for Enoi during Yom Kippur itself? So Minayan, so where do you get this from? So the Brysa answers as follows. Lo yomar oinesh bimalacha degomer mi'inoi. So the answer is like this. It's not necessary for the Torah to write the penalty for doing malacha on Yom Kippur. You know why? Because once I know that the penalty for Enoi, uh, for, for failure of Enoi on Yom Kippur is kares, then I can make the following kalvachomer. Uma Enoi sheinu nohig b'shabasus v'yomim tovim onish kares, malacha sheinu heges b'shabasus v'yomim tovim lo, lo kol shekein. If I get kares for a specific prohibition of Enoi, then surely I should get kares for a more universal prohibition like doing malacha. That's the, that's the Bryce's argument. And therefore, lama ne'amar, why then was it necessary for the Torah to write the penalty uh, for, for malacha on Yom Kippur? Mufne lahakish v'lodun mimene gezeira shava. It's superfluous in order to make the following gezeira shava between malacha and inoi. Nem are onesh be inoi, venem are onesh be malacha. The penalty is written by inoi, and it's written by malacha. Ma malacha lo anash ele imkein hisir, af inoi lo anash ele imkein hisir. That just like by malacha, you need the thou shalt not before the penalty is, is explained, so too the extraneous verbiage of uh, for malacha you transfer over to inoi to tell you that even though the Torah doesn't write it explicitly, the thou shalt not, it's as if it wrote it explicitly. That's the purpose of the extra verbiage written by Malacha. So now the Gemara says, but wait a minute, I think this may be a continuation of the Brisa. The Brisa says, but you could challenge that Kalva Chomer. You told me that the verbiage of the penalty is superfluous for Malacha on Yom Kippur because once I know that you get Kares for Eno, you surely get Kares for Malacha. But one second, maybe that's not the case. Maybe Enoi is more Chamur than Malacha in one sense. Because Malacha, we know sometimes the Isser is alleviated. Sometimes the Isser is removed. In what case is there no Isser of Malacha? There's no Isser of Malacha for bringing Karbanos on Shabbos and Yantum. But whereas there's, there's never an alleviation of the Isser of Enoi, so therefore maybe Enoi is more Chamer. So just because it's written Kares by Enoi doesn't automatically imply that there's Kares for Malacha. So let's reverse it. Let's rather say like this. The Torah didn't have to write the penalty by Enoi, because once I know that there's a penalty of kares for Malacha, then surely there'll be a penalty of kares for Enoi. Ma Malacha shuhutra michlala anush kares, Enoi shalohutra michlala lo kol shekein. If you get kares for something which sometimes is alleviated, like Malacha, then surely you'll get kares for Enoi, which is never alleviated. Lama Nemar, why then did the Torah have to write the penalty by 
by Enoi, Mufna Lahakish Belodin Mimena Gezer Shava, Namar Onish Be Enoi, Venamar Onish Be Malacha, Ma Malacha Anash Behizir, Af Enoi Anush Behizir. It's to tell you as follows it's to create a Gezer Shava that is supposed to connect the prohibition of Malacha to the prohibition of Enoi, and it's to tell you as follows that just like by the Isra Malacha there's an Azhara, there's a Thou shalt not, and there's a penalty, so too. By Enoi, even though the thou shalt not is not explicit because of the Gzeir Shava, it's as if it's written by Enoi as well. The, the Brisa continues and says, But Ikala Mifrach, Ma'la Malacha Shekeno Heges Bishabasus Fiyomim Tovim, Tomar Bi Enoi Shenanoig Bishabasus Fiyomim Tovim. But go, go back in the other direction. And I think this is really the Gemara just jumping back and forth. It's no longer the Brisa, because as we see from the Ravina has to jump in and answer the question. But basically, the Gemara is saying, where do you see? We, we, uh, let's go back to the, to, the, to the other position. Maybe Malacha is more Chamor than Enoi. So you can't make a Kalva Chamor from Enoi to Malacha, because maybe Malacha is, is more Chamor. Maybe the fact that the Torah writes the penalty of Kares by Malacha is ex- exclusively for Malacha, because... Malach is a more universal iser. Just because it's written by Malach doesn't mean I, I would all automatically know that it applies to Enoi. So therefore, you're back to square one. You don't have a right to assume that just uh, when it's written by one, you can uh, infer the other one that there's Karitz. <coughs> so therefore, Amar Ravina, Haitana, Etzem, Etzem, Goma. So Ravina says, you're right. It's really not from the fact that you didn't have to write the penalty by either one, but rather the word Etzem, as in Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh, on that self-same day, is written both in the context of Enoi and, by, and in the context of Malacha. <coughs> so we make a Gzei Shava that way, that just like by Malacha, there's an Azhara and there's an so too, even though the Azhara is not written explicitly, the Gzei Shava makes that it is as if it's explicit for Enoi as well. The Gemara now says, Mufna, you must say that one of, at least one of the words etzem is superfluous, de'ilo mufna ikala mifrach kideparchinon, because if not, you'd be able to create a logical refutation, as we've just brought. Now let me just clarify this point. This is a Shas concept, which has to do with biblical hermeneutics, how Chazal are able to make Zerah Shavas. This, ha- this occurs in many places in Shas. Chazal will tell you that sometimes a Gzeir Shava is beyond reproach, and sometimes it is subject to logical refutation. What are the criteria when a Gzeir Shava is beyond reproach, despite any logical differences between Halacha A and Halacha B? When you have a Gzeir Shava, where the verbiage in at least one of the psukim is superfluous, so then it's clear that the Ribbono Shalom, when he put that word in the Torah, wanted you to make a connection between Halacha A and Halacha B that, uh, that will transcend any logical challenges. If, however, there's a Gzei Roshava with between Halacha A and Halacha B because of common verbiage in, in the two places in the, in the Chumash, and the words themselves are not superfluous, which means that they are needed for the text itself, for the context itself. So then the Gzei Shava only goes so far as to allow you to make the connection when there are no logical refutations. But if you can make a logical distinction between Halacha A and Halacha B, then the Gzei Shava does not trump the logical argument. So the Gemara says, if the word Be'etzem would not be superfluous, either in place A or place B, either by Enoi or Malacha, we would be able to make a logical challenge and say that just because there's an Azhara written for Malacha doesn't necessarily mean that you can apply that to Enoi because Malacha is a more universal and therefore more Hamar Iser and maybe that doesn't apply to Enoi. So, so, so you see that the Gemara is saying that there are logical differences. So unless you, you are able to demonstrate that the word be'etzem is superfluous, we'll be able to refute the Gzei Roshava. So the Gemara says le'ayi. You're absolutely right. Afnuye uh, mufne, it is superfluous. And how do we know this? Mechdi. Because let's think about this for a second. Let's examine this. Chamisha kroi ksivi bimalacha. There are five different psukim written in regard to Yom Kippur having to do with the Isra Malacha. Chad la'azhara diyamama v'chad la'azhara delelia. One of the five is to tell you that there's an Isra Malacha during the day. 
Another one of the five say that there's an Issa Malacha the night of Yom Kippur. V'chad la'oinish the Yamama, v'chad la'oinish the Lelia. Uh, the, another pasuk is to tell you that there is a penalty for doing malacha of kares during the day, and the fourth one is to tell you that there's a penalty of kares for doing malacha on Yom Kippur at night. So that leaves you with one extra phrase of malacha that is laafnu yevachad laafnu lamigmar inu mi malacha bein diyamama bein delalia, and it's to tell you that just like we have an azhara and an onesh written for the Yisra Malacha on Yom Kippur, so do we apply that same structure and apply that to Inuit. Even though there's no explicit Pasuk of Azhara for Inuit, because the Gzair Shava, it's as if it's written for Inuit as well. Now, Devei Rebbe Yishmoel Tana, now we have a different version in the Brisa. They say, Nemar Khan Inuit Venemar Lahalan Inuit. They learn it out from a, a different Gzei Roshava, not between Enoi and Malacha on Yom Kippur, but rather there are two places in the Torah which talks about Enoi. One is Yom Kippur, and the other one is a case of rape, when a man rapes a woman. There the Torah calls Asher Ina es Eishas Re'ehu, that if a man afflicts the wife of his fellow, Ma lahalan lo anash ele imkein hiser, just like over there, the Torah has has to say both the lo sa'ase and the penalty. Afkan lo anash ele imkein hizir. So, so too, we, even though there's no explicit azhara by the Enoi of Yom Kippur, because it's connected to the Enoi by the case of Ones in, the, in Sefer Devarim, it's as if the, the, the azhara is written there as well, uh, here as well. Ravacha bar Yaakov Omar, Yolif Shabbat Shabbat Shabbason Mishabbis Bereshis. Ravacha bar Yaakov says, I learn that the way that we know that there's an Azhara for Enoi on Yom Kippur is by making a Limud from Shabbos. That just like by Shabbos, Malahalan lo anash ele imkein hisir, Afkan lo anash ele imkein hisir. And just like by Shabbos, there's, there's both a, an Azhara and an Onesh, because Yom Kippur is called Shabbos, we learn from there that so too Yom Kippur, there's an Azhara and there's an Onesh. Rav Papa Omar, um, Gufe Shabbos Ikri. And Rav Papa says, you don't need a Gzera Shava. He says that Yom Kippur itself is called Shabbos. It's not based on a Gzera Shava between Yom Kippur and Shabbos. Like Rashi says, Uvalav Gzera Shava nami nafgamine ubei de keven de Ikri Shabbos linin inoi havalei ke Shabbos laonish vazara. That Yom Kippur itself is called a Sabbath. And therefore, just like all other Shabbosos, there's both an Azhara and an Onesh. So too, Yom Kippur has an implicit Azhara, even though it's not written explicitly, because it's called a Shabbos, that Azhara is implicit. So now the Gemara says, look, Bishlam Rav Papa lo Amar Karabacha Bar Yaakov, Dikra Dixiv Begufe Adif. I can understand why Rav Papa would not say like Rav Acha Bar Yaakov. Remember, Rav Acha Bar Yaakov says he learns the Gezeir Shava from, from, uh, from Shabbos, to Yom Kippur. Rav Papa says you don't need a Gzeir Shava, you don't need to take from a foreign place and connect it. Yom Kippur itself is called the Sabbath, and the, by virtue of the fact that Yom Kippur itself is called the Sabbath, that makes it like Shabbos in all respects, so that there's an implicit Azhara and an Onish. So I can understand why Rav Papa prefers not to make a Gzeir Shava. Ella, Ravacha Bar Yaakov, my time ala Omar ke Rav Papa. But why doesn't Ravacha Bar Yaakov learn like Rav Papa? Instead of saying that there's a Gzeir Shava, just say that Yom Kippur is implicitly a Sabbath. So he says, Mi boy le lechidetanya. Ravacha Bar Yaakov will tell you, I'll tell you why. Because the fact that Yom Kippur is called the Sabbath t- tells me a different halacha. It doesn't tell me the halacha that there's an implicit azhara by Yom Kippur, but rather it tells me a different halacha. The Bryce says, V'ini semes nafsho seichem b'sisho lachodesh. The Torah says, you shall afflict your souls on the ninth of the month. Now, my friends, I ask you, what day of the month is Yom Kippur? The tenth. You didn't know that? Yeah, yeah, I say like, <laughs> It's the 10th of Tishrei, right? So why does the Torah call it the 9th of Tishrei? So, Yachal Yaschal V'Yisana B'Sishra. So you might think that this, the Torah means that you're supposed to begin your affliction on the 9th. Tamul Omar Ba'erev. No, it says in the eve, after the 9th. So, I Ba'erev, Yachal Misha Tachshach. But if, if that's the case, then maybe you should only have to start fasting when it gets dark. Tamul Omar B'Sishra. So therefore, the Torah says the 9th. 
Why does the Torah say the ninth? Let it just say the, at the beginning of the tenth. So ha'ketzad maschalu misanami ba'odiyom, bikan shemosifin michol ala kodesh. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to start fasting at the end of the ninth, before the beginning of the tenth day, before it gets dark. And that teaches me the concept of Tosefis, that we've that which we've been discussing up until now. And that only tells me that Pasuk of Bisisha Bachodesh Ba'erev only tells me that you're supposed to have Tosefis, you're supposed to add on to Yom Kippur at the beginning. How do you know that you're supposed to add on to Yom Kippur at the end and wait a few minutes before you start eating? Tamulomar may erev ad erev. So the Torah says from Eve till Eve which teaches me that whatever applies to the beginning of Yom Kippur also applies to the end. Just like at the beginning you have to have Tosefes, so too at the end you have to have Tosefes. Ve'enli ele Yom HaKippurim, Shabbosos Minayin. And that only tells me that on Yom Kippur you're supposed to add on from Chol onto Kodesh. How do you know that on a regular Shabbos you're supposed to accept Shabbos early and escort Shabbos out late? Tamulomar Tish Besu. And therefore, the Torah says by Yom Kippur, thou shalt make Shabbos. And the fact that the Torah calls Yom Kippur a Sabbath in that context, on that context, teaches me the halacha that just like Yom Kippur has Tosefes, so too Shabbos has Tosefes. Ein li ela Shabbosos. Yomim tovim minayin. So that now only tells me Yom Kippur and Shabbos. How do you know that on Yom Tov also you're supposed to have Tosefes? Tamulomar Shabbatichem, an additional word Shabbos. So basically, Rav Bar Yaakov says the fact that Yom Kippur is called the Sabbath only teaches me Hakeitzad Kol Makom Shnemar Shavos Mosifin Micholal Hakodesh. Any time where the Torah uses the verb of Shabbos. That teaches me that on that day, which is called the Shabbos, you're supposed to add from the weekday onto the holy day. So Rav Achabar Yaakov will tell you the fact that Yom Kippur is called Shabbos does not teach me about it, the Azhara that's implicit, like Rav Bapa is suggesting, but rather is teaching me a different concept that you're supposed to have Tosefes Shabbos and Tosefes Yom Tov and Tosefes Yom Kippur. Now, the Tana de Etzem Etzem, Hai Besisha Lachodesh Mai Ovid So now we're going back to our previous Tana on the, on the previous page. On the previous page, we had a Tana who worked under the following assumption. Remember, what was the, the, what was the flow of the previous Brisa? The Brisa started off by saying, I know that you're supposed to add on to Yom Kippur. How do you know that if you violate Malacha on the add-on period of Yom Kippur that you don't get Kares? Remember that part? right? And how do you know that if you eat during that Tosefis period you don't get Kares? So the Tana was working under the assumption that there's, an, that there's an implicit mitzvah of Tosefes. So the question, therefore, is, if he's not using this drasha that we just saw about Shabbat Tichem, what does he do with the Pasuk of Shabbat Tichem, which, 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 that the Torah calls Yom, Yom, Yom Kippur Shabbos? In other words, the very fact that the Torah excludes the Tosefis period from the liability of Kares in and of itself is the teaching that there's supposed to be a Tosefis. If that's the case, then you don't need the, the word Shabbat to teach me that there's a mitzvah of Tosefis because you learn it implicitly from the fact that the Torah excludes it from Kares. So what does that Tana do with this Pasuk of Shabbat He uses it to teach me something else. Why does the Torah call the ninth day a Sabbath? Or why does the Torah say to afflict yourself on the ninth day? The Torah says, afflict your souls on the ninth. We don't afflict ourselves on the ninth. We only afflict ourselves on the tenth. So why does it write it that way? The famous teaching that anyone who properly eats on the ninth of Tishrei is attributed by scripture as if he had fasted both the ninth and the tenth. Which means like this, if you prepared properly 
to allow yourself to fast on the 10th by eating nutritiously on the 9th, then God rewards you as if you had fasted both on the 9th and the 10th because you spent the day 9 preparing for your fasting on day 10. It's not alluding that on the 9th, if you overeat, it's considered an affliction too, right? Just, no, 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 that's... The, no, but, no, 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 no. What, what David is saying is to be taken seriously. There is an opinion that would interpret yeah, the Gemara right. this way. But that's not the way Rashi learns over here. There are some poskim who say that by eating on the 9th, it becomes harder for you to eat on the t- to to fast on the tenth wow. because it's it's harder to fast on a full on a full stomach, right? But so that could be one way of learning it. But the way Rashi learns that at least here in our sugya is you prepared properly by by uh, uh, by eating the proper nutrition on the ninth, so it will allow you to f- give you the strength to fast on the tenth. I understand you get the merit for that, but I, it, are they, is he saying it is an affliction to? No, it's it's you get the reward as if you fasted on the ninth day. So it's not it's not that you're afflicted on the ninth. It's not that you're afflicted, but God says you worked hard to prepare, right? So to get ready, so it's right. So you get you get rewarded for that. So b- the bottom line is is that that's the purpose of why the Torah talks about Yom Kippur in the terms of day nine, and not just in day ten, and therefore. That's the reason why the Torah writes it in that way. Not to talk about the mitzvah of Tosefis, which I know from from the fact that it's excluded from kares, but rather it's to tell me a halacha of, it's as if you fasted on the ninth and you're rewarded for There's that. There's no allusion here to the speck of the yom. In other words, it should really be you know, no. fasting two days, right? No. no, 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 no. There's no such thing as speck of the yom in, biblically. I know, but I'm just saying. The, the Torah never talks about Sveik Dioma. No, no, that's not a discussion here. <laughs> okay, let's go back to our Mishnah. If a person eats food that's not edible, he's not punishable. If a person chews on peppercorns on Yom Kippur, he's potter, because you're just chewing on a peppercorn, that's not food, right? You know, it's... Uh, I guess if you're starving, maybe, but it's not normal food. If a person chews on ginger on Yom Kippur, he's also potter. Again, it's not something that you normally eat. My dad eats ginger coated in sugar, which we'll talk about in just a second. You ever, you ever see that? Ever people yeah, eat it? Yeah, right, sure. Yeah, okay. There you go. Stomach, stomach, you're a holistic yeah, guy. Yeah. Okay. So, Meisve, let's challenge this from a Brysa. Hayya Rebbe Meir Omer, Mimash Mishanamar Va'aral Tem Orla So Espirio, Eina Yodea She'etz Machalu. See, the Torah in the context of the mitzvah of Orla, which is that when you plant a tree during the first three years, you're not allowed to eat the fruit. The Torah says that you have to declare that tree orla, and it calls that tree an eitz ma'achal, a tree that is has edible produce. Now, if the Torah already tells you that the fruit of that tree shall be orla, then obviously it's edible produce. So the words um, uh, eitz ma'achal are totally superfluous. Elamata malomer eitz ma'achal. It's referring to a specific kind of tree where the bark of the tree and the fruit of the tree both have flavor and they're equal flavors. And what kind of tree is that? It's talking about a peppercorn tree or maybe a peppercorn bush, probably more appropriately. This is to teach you that peppercorns are subject to the laws of Orla because it's considered to be a fruit. And also it's to teach you that Eretz Yisrael lacks for nothing. It's a land of amazing phenomena, even a, a land which has trees where the bark tastes just like the fruit. As the Torah says, that it should be a land that shall be lacking for nothing. But what do you see? What's the kasha from this brisa? The brisa calls peppercorns a fruit. If peppercorns are a fruit, how can you tell me that it's not an edible food? The Gemara answer is lo kasha ha habiyabeshta. There are two types of peppercorns. One's a dry peppercorn and one's a moist peppercorn. A fresh peppercorn, delicious. Have you ever tried a fresh peppercorn? Neither have I. But apparently it could be eaten as a food, and that's why it's called a fruit. But once it's dried out and you put it in your pepper mill, you can't just start pouring them out into your hand to start chewing on them. Amalei Ravina Lemaremar. 
Vehamar of Nachman Hai Himlasa the Asimi Bay Hindoi Sharyam of Archinalai Bori Priha Dhamma. Now we're asking on ginger. We said that ginger is not an edible food. But one second, there's a food called himlasa, which is they used to take ginger and they would uh, mix it with honey, like coat it with a sugary substance, and they would eat it. It came from the house of Hindu, which means it must have come from some from India, which is where we get which is where um, ginger comes from also today. Ginger is a very uh, popular uh, spice in, uh, in India and in the Far East, right? So the question is, is it permitted? Is there a problem of bishalakum or not? So they said, no, it's permitted. But the point is, is that you see that it, ginger is edible. So lokasha habaritifta habiyaveshta, same answer. Moist ginger is edible, and therefore... You know, it's uh, you would not be allowed to eat that on Yom Kippur, but that's not what we're talking about over here. We're talking about a guy munching on hard, dried out ginger. That's not a food item, and therefore, if you do that, then you're going to be putter. Uh, Tana Rabbanan, I assume that you know the powdered ginger that you use as a spice in your baking, that's from dried ginger, right? So if you just took a spoonful of uh, ginger spice and you just put it in your mouth, you wouldn't be liable on Yom Kippur. Achal alekanim potter. The Bryson now says that if a person eats bamboo leaves, he's potter. But lulve gefanim chayv, if he eats uh, vine shoots, which are more tender, so then he's violating Yom Kippur. That is considered to be a food item. Elohim lulve gefanim. And what is the definition of vine shoots? Amar Rabbi Yitzchak migdala kol shaliv levu meirosh hashana ve'edam hakipurim. It shoots that grow just during a 10-day window from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur when the plants are just starting to grow, right? So then the soft shoots are edible during that time. But if they grow past that, they already become too hard and are no longer edible. Is that kind of coincidental? That this, uh... <laughs> I'm sure there's something deeper here. I'm sure there is. Varav Kahana Omar, I guess maybe because between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you're supposed to be pliable and soft. Oh, okay. Omar <laughs> And Rav Kahana says, no, it's the first 30 days of their growth beyond just the 10 days. So Tanya Kavase, the Rabbi Yitzchak Migdullah, we have a Brisa that goes like Rabbi Yitzchak, who says it's only the 10 days. That if you eat um, bamboo leaves, it's potter because it's not a food, but if you eat vine shoots, you're chayiv. And Eluhein Lulvei Gefanim, Kol Shaliv Levu Me Rosh Hashanah Ve'Yanam Kippur. And the definition of uh, vine shoots is only when they grow during that small window of time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Shas Atzir Amuriyas Potter, we also saw in the Mishnah that if a person drinks brine or fish or oil brine, then you're going to be potter because that's not a beverage, right? You can use it as a as a as a uh, dressing, but you wouldn't drink it alone as a beverage. So ha chomets chayev. It sounds like from our Mishnah that if you drink vinegar, which is I guess a little bit closer to what people might uh, want to drink, then that is enough of a beverage to make you chayev. So masnisin money. Rebbe he detanya Rebbe Omer chometz meishivus anefesh. This must go like Rebbe who says that vinegar is something that even if you drink it alone, gives you peace of mind. So it does it does take away the inoy factor according to Rebbe. Darash Rav Gidel bar Menashemi biri dinarash ein halacha kerebi. He once publicly expounded that we don't paskin like Rebbe. We hold that even if you drink vinegar, you also don't have Yishuv Hadas, and that still you're still considered to be uh, under affliction, and therefore you haven't <laughs> violated Yom Kippur. So Nafki Kulei Alma Mazgu Lashana Nafki Kulei Alma Mazgu Suchala. The next year, after they heard the drasha, everyone out on Yom Kippur and had flasks of vinegar with them to. Uh, to, uh, to drink, to sip over Yom Kippur. So Shama Rav Gidl V'ikbid, Rav Gidl heard about this and he hit the roof. He says, Omar, Amar da Amri Ana di Evid, Lechachil mi Amri. I was just saying that Bidi Evid, if you did it, you're not in violation. But whoever said the Lechachil, I would give you a heter to do this. And furthermore, Amar da Amar da Amri Ana Purta, Tuva mi Amri. And furthermore, I only said if you drank just a small amount, your Pater, whoever gave you a heter to drink mass quantities. And Amar da Amri Ana Chai, Mazug mi Amri. And I also only was talking about pure, unadulterated vinegar. That doesn't give you um, relief. But if you drink it diluted with water and spices, and you can mamish make it into like a borscht beverage, and it's a machaya. 
So that for sure you're going to be in violation of Yom Kippur. So he was really upset, which is another example of Chachamim Hizaharu B'divrechem. Even when something is mutter, you got to know how to say it, and uh, and or, or when something here it was, he wasn't saying that it was mutter, but he apparently he was misunderstood. Anyway, have a wonderful day.